Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to the Water Magic Workshop. Every time I do one of these, we're kind of having some kind of storm here. So we have some kind of cyclone warning here today in New Orleans. So uh, if I disappear, I'll come back. The cyclone didn't get me, just the Wi-Fi. So uh, welcome, welcome. It's such an honor to be part of this event again. I hope they keep doing them and I hope I get chosen to be part of the event again and again. Uh, my book with Llewellyn is Water Magic which was really a joy to write. I got a chance to write about all the sacred waters from all over the world in all different capacities. So I hope people check that out. I know there's some kind of promos and stuff going on today from Llewellyn, so that's wonderful. But we're gonna talk about sacred waters today. And sacred waters can come in all shapes and forms and, you know, the thing that really struck me when I started talking about water magic is that even if we don't feel a connection to water, which a lot of people do tell me that, you know, just reading this book and that's why they got the book and that's why they might be in this class. The planet is mostly made up of water. Our bodies are mostly made up of water. Our hearts and our minds are even a greater percentage of water than the body as a whole. So you have water inside of you. You know, we need water to live. We have to drink water. We're born in water. There's a giant flood of water. That's what starts the birth. And then more water happens. Anybody who's done it knows that more water happens afterwards. So there's a lot of water. And even if you don't necessarily feel that magical connection to water, water has been with you through every step of your life, through every part of your life, in every little teeny facet of your life. And one of the things that really hit home for me with the pandemic, because I released this water magic book last year, is that I had thought I was going to go to all these sacred water sites. You know, I did get a chance to move to New Orleans. So that's a much different kind of watery city than Brooklyn, where I was originally from, where I was born and raised. And that New Orleans is here underneath the water. But I had intended to go to some of these sacred sites that I talk about in the book, Snoqualmie Falls, the sacred sites in Tibet, the sacred sites in Central America. And it really made me very sad. I'm a, I'm a vagabond, roguey, travel -y kind of person. It made me sad that I couldn't go and see all these waters, but I had to remember and refocus, which we all had to do during the hardest times of the lockdown and realize that water was still all around me. So we're gonna talk about a lot of the different magical waters that we might come across. Now, I always start with May rainwater. I started with my traditional witchcraft training when I was a preteen almost. And one of the things that my teachers told me when I began was that May rainwater was the best. And I'm sure some of you know that the logic of this comes from May being the time of Beltane or Beltena and that half of the year about being, you know, renewal and rejoicing and, and opening up to change and joy and getting ready for the springtime and, and, you know, looking forward to the harvest and all of these things that happen at that time. So May rainwater does carry its own special kind of, I apologize, it's June, so you can't rush out and get it. But next May, try and remember, but May rainwater does have that special character. And, and I like to use it in a lot of my spells if I can, because it does open up the possibilities for rebirth and growth and all of those things that I think are really important qualities when we're crafting our own individual magics. Now, I mentioned this book, there's a lot of different spells and formulas and, and my younger friends, like six or seven, like to say that Lilith does potions. So <laughs> Lilith does indeed do potions and there are recipes for potions in this book as well. But a lot of, I, and I think this is normal for people who've been doing magic for some time. A lot of my magic comes from the same way I would cook a traditional recipe. I know what the basic ingredients are. I know what needs to go in there and then I can tweak it and change it to my own desires and my own likes. So May Rainwater is one of those things that's really good to add to a sacred bath that you're doing. Even if somebody else made the sacred bath, 
add a little teeny bit of, of May rainwater to put that extra something into it that'll personalize it for you, that'll allow you to sort of expand your magic and have something extra in there. So what do we call it in New Orleans? Lanyap. That's when you get something extra and it helps you get where you need to go just a little bit easier. So that's one of the things that I really like to do with magical waters. Now, obviously we have May rainwater one other thing that I like to talk about is using your own tap water. Everybody has their tap water. Maybe you can't go to the sacred sites, you can't go to Niagara Falls, or you can't go to, you know, the Iguazu Falls or something like that to get magical water, but you do have tap water. And that water, no matter where you live, snakes its way from the source throughout pipes miles and miles twisting and turning and picking up the character of everything as it goes along the way to find its way to you so that has a special spirit of place for me so i think dismissing it as oh this is just water that comes out of the tap is really doing it a disservice because we have this magical water that is specifically just for us just for this location just for what we're doing so think of that when you're filling your bucket to clean your house or when you're filling the bathtub or getting in the shower. It has that water that's specially designed and directed to you. So again, it's it's not necessarily always about going to great lengths to get your magical ingredients. Some of your magical ingredients will be right there. And if you can treat them with more reverence and intent, that will help you do what you need to do easier. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so there are a lot of other kinds of waters that people are used to as well. Uh, this is one that I like a lot. And if you had a bad, you know, traditional religious experience and you don't want to use holy water, you can make your own. I remember once I was at an event uh, probably about 20 years ago now, and we didn't have any holy water. And I was doing a version of this sacred waters and baths class that we're talking about today. And I got all the high priests and priestesses that were at the event to bless the water. And that made its own special kind of holy water, you know, not attached to the Catholic Church or, or traditional Christian values, which again, a lot of people have an issue with. But if you don't have an issue with that and you do have a special church, maybe one that your family went to, maybe one that has the character or the energy of what it is you're trying to create, this holy water here I have is from the shrine of St. Jude here in New Orleans. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with it. It has a gigantic healing grotto. So the water is said to have extra special healing properties. Uh, it's also a shrine for St. Jude. So for those of you who are familiar with St. Jude and hoodoo practices, St. Jude is the patron saint of impossible causes. So I like to keep that in mind when I'm using it in particular spells, because maybe you're doing something that might be a little bit un impossible. Maybe you're looking for something that might be a little bit bigger than what you have right now. And St. Jude for me is really good in that aspect to get that energy in there. I'm reaching into a realm that heretofore for me had been impossible. And St. Jude is gonna lend his sacred energy through this water to whatever working I'm doing. I like to use it in baths. I like to use it as washes when I'm doing cleaning down the candles just to get all the gunk and stuff off from them from the store or anybody's negative energy or something like that off of it. So that's holy water. It's used in a lot of hoodoo formulas, obviously, because you know they were enslaved people and they didn't necessarily have access to some of these. I mean, literally, you're an enslaved person. You can't necessarily go and get these things that you might need, but they did have access to a lot of the, you know, through forced colonization and conversion, they did have access to a lot of these elements of Christianity and they did incorporate them into the, their own magics for use because they didn't have a choice and they uh, crafted them for what they needed to craft them for. So that's one good thing about holy water. Again, if you had a different church that you liked, like I said, maybe one that you went to as a child or one that your family went to, you can use the holy water from there. And it's good for blessings. It's good for protection. It's good for, you know, I got one of my 500 emails this morning about, oh, I think I've been cursed. It's good for that. Just getting all that kind of negativity off of you and out of the situation, anything unnecessary gone. And that's what it's good for. The other waters that I busted out with here for you today, I mentioned May Rainwater, this is from this year. Uh, I make a 
water and the recipes in the book, but I'm going to give you a short version of it today that I call happy water. And here's a bottle of my happy water. Uh, happy water. I just like to use it when I'm going to be in any situation where I might be feeling anxiety. Maybe I need to go somewhere. I don't like large. I mean, despite I'm from New York and I live in New Orleans, I don't like large crowds of people. So if I have a little bit of anxiety about being a large crowd or doing something where I don't feel 100 percent comfortable, I'll take the happy water. I'll put it on my hands because that way everything I touch will bring happiness to me. I'll put it on my feet or the bottoms of my shoes because that way everywhere I walk, every direction I turn will be the happiest possible place for me to be. And again, these little things I think can really help you incorporate magic into your day. It doesn't necessarily have to be something grandiose where I've got 500 ingredients and I'm making a sacred floor wash and I'm scrubbing from the ceilings to the floors. By all means, if you want to do that, go ahead and do that. It's a very powerful way of transformation, but sometimes we don't necessarily have time to do all of those things. So there are much smaller ways where we can still be magical in our day-to-day -day lives and improve the overall character of it. So happy water is very simple. I use Florida water. Now, um, a lot of people have recipes for Florida water. I also believe I have one in the magical book, but you know, they don't give me any money, but they should. I use Murray and Landman Florida water. Uh, they've been around since 1811. Uh, my great, great grandmother used to use Murray and Landman water. I, my mother told me she remembers seeing it in the house and she used it on a daily basis. The formula has been the same since then. It's a secret. And uh, they do have other Florida waters out there. A lot of people make Florida waters. But for me, I do like this one because it seems to have a cleansing energy that I have not seen to the same degree in other commercial creations of it. And uh, it's pretty widely available. So I, I do recommend that. So the happiness water is equal parts Florida water and rose water. Rose water for me, again, is the same thing like the Florida water. You can make it yourself, but it's a very detailed and complicated process. I've tried to make it, I think, maybe three or four times. And uh, maybe it's just because I'm not a very patient person, but... <laughs> <coughs> It hasn't come out 100% the best way that I wanted it to. So you can get it from uh, natural food stores uh, because there's edible rose water, which I think is great because then you know you're not putting anything in your magic that you couldn't put into your body. This is something, I mean, I wouldn't drink Florida water, but rose water, there is a food grade rose water, so you can use it for cooking. But I do like to use it for the spells as well because that way I know it's completely 100% safe and it's going to be the least you know, harmful to the environment, to my skin for all these other reasons. So it's equal parts of that. Then spring water, which is all about renewal and regeneration and uh, all those good things like that. Spring water is pretty much the, my generalized go-to other than tap water for when I want to have something that's just going to bulk it up. So, you know, it's inexpensive, it's easy. You know, you would put, you know, maybe you wanna put it in a cup of it in the bath. That's really good for renewal and regeneration. What I usually do is equal parts of the rose water and the Florida water, maybe about an ounce each, and then add that to about eight ounces of spring water or tap water for spirit of place. And I really love amber. So the other thing that I use in that is, amber. So I use a couple of drops of amber because that's what for me is one of those scents that represents happiness. It makes me feel really happy. You could also use something like jasmine, a drop or two of jasmine essential oil, and then you've got the happiness water. And like I said, you can use that on your hands. You can use it on your feet. I like to put it in a spray bottle, spray my doormats. I spray my, you know, anytime that I'm having difficulty, anytime that I'm feeling stress, I'll use it to spray my pillows before I go to sleep because I want to have happy dreams dreams and happy thoughts while I'm in that space. I'll use it. Maybe I'll add a little bit of it to the laundry water. So there's lots of ways that you can incorporate these things into stuff that you're already doing to make it that little bit extra and more magical. 
So we're going to talk about a couple more things before we get to the question and answer portion of this, which is going to happen a little over five minutes. I'm looking at the time right here. Okay, so pond water. Now, pond water is, is stagnant, but it also has so much life teeming in it. So when people use pond water, what they usually use it for is opportunities. You know, there's organisms in there. There's life in there. There's growth in there. So using just a teeny bit, because obviously, you don't want a whole bunch of pond water because then you'll get nasty stuff growing on it and use it quickly as well because pond water, like I said, does have life in it. But if you wanted to add an ounce of that to a gallon of your wash water for your house, that would be wonderful. You can use it to wash your windows because you want to see opportunities. You know, again, we're talking about sympathetic magic where you can use things that are very direct. And, and for me, that's, that's a large chunk of how magic works. If I do my windows so I can see opportunity coming, so I can see opportunity when it presents itself. That's something that's really helpful. Now, I mentioned we're having storms here. Uh, in I'm a voodoo priestess in addition to being an author and a filmmaker and a dancer. But uh, one of the things that in African traditional religions, in La Regla Lakumi, we have an Orisha known as Oya, and she is the Orisha of the hurricane and talk about the hurricane bringing the hot winds and, and crossing the Atlantic and bringing about very quick and sudden and serious change. So when we use hurricane water, it's when you need a situation to change immediately. Maybe you have a boss at work that you really wish he got a different job or you really wish they move along or you get a different job. So you might take some of that hurricane water, put it in a spray bottle and spray it around the office because you're asking for quick change in that situation that you don't want to be in. Hurricane water is also really good when you're trying to change a situation that feels stuck. Maybe you're waiting for an answer about something that's really important to you. Take a piece of paper, write down the situation, dip it in the hurricane water, and then take it out and leave it at the crossroads. So that change is gonna be coming. So that change will find you. So you'll have that direction and the right message and the right solution will present itself to you. So that's one of the good things to do with hurricane water. There's a lot of different uh, ATR, African traditional religious deities that revolve around water. I don't know if anybody out there is watching the new Netflix show, High on the Hog. I've been a really big fan of Jessica B. Harris since the very beginning, and I'm so happy that she got a Netflix show talking about African-American foodways and going back to Africa. And you get a little teeny piece of that because the show opens in Benin. And for African traditional religions, probably the most widely known uh, divinity that's connected to water is called Mami Wata. M-A-M-I-W-A-T-A, -A -A, Wata, like they spell it in Jamaica, Wata. And she comes from Benin, which is in West Africa. And she's represented by all water. There's an amazing scene in In Search of Voodoo by Jaiman Honsu, uh, where he goes back to Benin and talks about voodoo and, and they show two different ceremonies for Mami Wata. But basically, I think what I'm trying to get across to you right now is that this is an ancient divinity going back over a thousand years that we have seen in this portion of Africa, which I'm also an anthropologist, is accepted as the cradle, the birthplace of humanity. And we have this divinity called Mami Water and she is represented every time there is water. So again, I could get a cup of water from the kitchen and that is Mami Water, that is representative of Mami Wada. That is representative. I'm going in and out. I apologize. That is representative of Mami Wada. So every time that you have water there, that connects us to this great foremother, that connects us to this ancestral water, this power of water that encompasses the earth and is so much of an integral part in each of our lives. So that's just another thing that you can acknowledge when you're looking at these sacred waters, when you're working with sacred waters, all of these things. As I mentioned, you can put them in your washes, you can put them in your baths. I even sometimes like to put like just a little teeny bit in with my dishwashing soap or in the washing machine or something like that. If I want to, and this is gonna be the last thing I talk about because I'm looking at we're at 19 minutes, but one thing that I like to do is make an ancestral water. Now, uh, for me, I usually tell people that 
The ancestors are a great place to start. You can leave water on your ancestor altar, put a candle, put a picture of them, put something that they might have liked during their life, leave that up there so you can just sort of remember and connect to them. But two of the things that I like to do when I'm talking about ancestral waters is get water from the cemetery. When you go to the cemetery, there's spigots in the cemetery, people bring flowers, they wanna put water on those flowers. So there are spouts you can get there, leave an offering, leave maybe a stone that has special significance to you, maybe leave a biodegradable offering like some water from your own home that you're giving an equal exchange of water and take some water from that spigot there at the cemetery. If you know where your ancestors are buried and you can go to that cemetery and get some water from there, that's great. If you don't know where they're buried, you can go to the cemetery that's closest to your house because that's gonna be a special connection to you because that's where the dead that are closest to your home actually are. Or you could go online and I just wanna say this and get water from where your ancestors might've been from. I have a lot of ancestors from Africa. I also have ancestors from Europe. And one of the places I have ancestors for, and I find this so funny because this is Llewellyn Khan, is Wales. So I managed to get this Welsh water from <laughs> my salvage store that apparently nobody's buying Welsh water but me. But I got this and now I can offer my Welsh ancestors Welsh water direct from the source in Wales. So I'm going to open this up to questions now. And uh, I'm also just going to say really quickly that if anybody is interested in my classes, they can find out information on LilithDorsey.com. Uh, my water magic book, like I said, you can get from Llewellyn. My other two most recently released books are Arisha's Goddesses and Voodoo Queens. And just released this week, the re-release of my Voodoo and African Traditional Religion. So you can find links to those on my website. You can find uh, you know, them direct from the publisher. You can email me anytime at voodooniverse at yahoo.com, which is also the name of my blog, Voodoo Universe, the most popular voodoo blog in the world. So um, yay, let's see if there are any questions questions yay all right favorite water to work with yay okay do i have a favorite water to work with i do have a favorite water to work with it's that happiness water that i just talked about that's my favorite formula of water to work with and then it depends what I'm doing. I mean, usually when I have an ancestor water, I used to work for a uh, jazz musician, Dr. John. And a couple of weeks ago, we went to his father's grave, which he always used to like to go to uh, while he was alive. And we got some water from that cemetery. So very, it was the anniversary of his death. So I've been connecting with him a lot. And uh, he's been on my mind a lot. June 6th was the anniversary of his death. So I've been using that water a lot just recently. Okay, thank you everybody who said they read the books and they like the books. I, that's so amazing to me. You know, I, I write and I sit here in my dark room with my dark walls like a cave. And <laughs> it's amazing to me that my work goes out there in the world and I'm so happy that people are uh, really being receptive to it. Okay, do I use distilled water with crystals? We go into that a lot in the water magic book, exactly what types of water works best and what crystals work best together. Um, I think that this is something that people are just becoming mindful of, but there are a lot of crystals that you don't say put in the water and then use in your bath because they do disintegrate. A lot of them do have uh, minerals in them that are toxic at, at higher levels. So um, I'm very cautious when working with crystals and water. It's one thing if you're just going to have a crystal and, uh, you know, here's one of my favorite watery type crystals. You know, there's turquoise and in there. And if you're going to have this and you might want to use the spray on this and, you know, I'm not putting this on my skin or I'm not putting it in my box but if I just want to spray it to sort of charge it up, it's a love crystal anyway. I'm using rose water, which is a love type water. Obviously roses are connections to love. So if I wanted to charge this up for love, I might spritz it a teeny with a teeny bit. Again, you're not trying to disintegrate it. You don't want the you know stuff to leach out of it. 
Are there different types and recipes for water in my water magic book? Yes, there's a ton of spells in there. There's re there's actually food recipes in there as well. All, all my food recipes, I love to cook. I'm a big foodie. Um, my daughter worked for Dan L. Blue and David Chang, and uh, we're definitely a foodie family. So I'm really big on you know that kind of a thing. Okay, I'm interested in this, but I worry it's cultural appropriation. What are your thoughts on this? Thank you. Okay, so this is something I've done a lot of workshops on in the past. People can check my YouTube channel again. It's Lilith Dorsey, but uh, I've done a lot of workshops about cultural appropriation and racism within the community. And I think if you're worried about it, the easiest, quickest answer for me to give you is to stick with your own ancestors. If I know that my ancestors ancestors came from this certain part of Africa, or I know my ancestors came from this certain part of Central America, and I use water or sacred items for there, then I'm connecting through my heritage. And I do not, it's it's my own heritage. So you're not appropriating somebody else's culture, you're exploring your own heritage. The other line where I draw with that is about commodification. Am I taking somebody else's practice and turning it around and trying to sell it back to them, which I really don't think is right in any way, shape or form. So I think if you stay with yourself, if you stay with working on yourself, if you don't try and gatekeep or advise anybody else about it, except from your own knowledge, and your own practices, I think that's the safest way to go. But we all have ancestors. And even if you don't exactly know which ancestors you have, we have the benefit of DNA now. Um, two of my priestesses were uh, adopted, so they didn't necessarily know what their lineage was, but they still used the sacred water from where they were. They used the sacred water from the heritage and the information that they did know about, and they moved forward from here. Okay, what's the best way to start working with water? I think make some simple things for yourself. Like I said, I think that you could make yourself a blessing water. You could make yourself, let's say you wanna make one for happiness. I just gave you the one for happiness. That's a great way to get in touch with using water on a daily basis, as I mentioned. You know, put it on your hands in the morning, just realize you're going to be attracting things, you're going to be touching things, you're going to be taking things and putting things down with hands that have been magically blessed. Okay, in a baby's room, what water is good for spritzing around the room before putting them to bed? And what water works great to spritz in a sick person's room? Okay, and then a question about would I add crystals to each? I would check the list in the water magic book or go online and see what crystals are helpful. I usually don't like to put anything directly on the crib or in the bed. I've raised a lot of kids. Uh, I was a nanny for my day job and uh, I've raised... Wow, almost a dozen kids now. So there are things that you can do. Chamomile is something that's really good. I mean, it's one of the few things that they do use around children. So chamomile, and it's good for sleep. So what I would do is make a very, very weak tea with the chamomile, add that to some spring water, maybe spray it on the rug in the baby's room, spray it on the curtains in the baby's room. Same thing with lavender. Lavender is an all purpose. You can make lavender water just by kind of making a tea out of it and then straining it. <clears throat> you can use that. Lavender also promotes calm and sleep, which is a very good thing to have in the baby's room. Healing, uh, for me, I think I would, again, use lavender as a good thing for healing. There's other things that people do for healing. Uh, basil, again, these are things that are edible on some level. So I would use some basil, which is good for getting rid of all negativity and also healing. Same case with parsley. These are things that you probably have in your cupboard right now. Make a wheat tea with it. Make a water. Use that as the wash water for the floors. Use it as the wash water for underneath the bed. Maybe put a little, you know, I, this is another thing I really like to to do because especially with children and people who are sick this sometimes people are plagued by like nightmares or, or things like that putting salt water under the bed changing that every day that's something really simple that you can do it will attract all the negativity it will stop it from you know people the bad dreams from sort of getting 
to the person. It'll it'll trap them in the water and then you can, you know, dump it out and change it every day. So that's something that I like. And the crystals, I would research what is, you know, a long time ago, a lot of people used to put amber in the baby's room because that was supposed to help with teething. It was supposed to help with colic and other things like that. So there's also natural ingredients in, in gripe water, which is, again, our grandmothers all used gripe water. So these are things that I would think about, but I would check just to make sure this isn't a crystal that's going to do something completely different in water. There's hundreds of them. So um, it's more than I can get into in, in the next 45 seconds. <laughs> uh, happy Juneteenth, everybody. Uh, I'm a big Juneteenth fan. I mentioned my blog, Voodoo Universe. We've got lots of recipes on there that people can check out. There's lots of history or her story, as I like to say on there talking about that. And uh, let's see if there are any other questions that I missed. Okay. I don't think there are any other questions that I missed. I'm going back. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie and everybody else who says they've enjoyed the book or read the book or are a water witchy person. But yes, there are plenty of recipes in there. Uh, oh, somebody did ask about my schedule. So I'm just going to end with that. My website, LilithDorsey.com, has my upcoming schedule classes. If anybody wants to book a reading, like I said, if anybody wants to get any of these books, they can do that. But thank you so much. My time is up. And I love all y'all. And have a lovely day. <laughs>